that has occurred throughout the region and throughout the world relative to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, we had a previous discussion that focused on the leaders of the three largest federations in Trinidad and, and Tobago. It was a seminal position, a situation in that it demonstrated that where workers' rights are involved, there are no differences between the federations. And so we continue now by widening out and looking at the regional impact of COVID-19 and the, some of the experiences of workers in um, the region. Allow me to introduce the panelists. Um, we have from Grenada, Comrade Andre Lewis, who is the president of the Caribbean Congress of Labor, CCL, the secretariat of which is currently housed in uh, Cipriani College of Labor and Corporate, uh, Corporate Studies. So in a way, Comrade Andre is my boss. Um, from Barbados, we have Sandra Messiah of the Public Service International, PSI. Um, she is the Caribbean representative. And from Suriname, we have Claudette Etnel, Vice Chairman of the Trade Union Confederation, C47. Um, well, I don't have a bio beyond that for um, Comrade Andre. Um, we can always provide that for the recording at a later date. Um, let me just read uh, Comrade Sandra's uh, biography for you. Um, Sandra is Public Service International's PSI representative in the Caribbean, working with PSI's 22 affiliates in 20 countries and territories in the English French and Dutch speaking Caribbean. She currently represents PSI on the Gender Equity Hub, a thematic hub in the Global Health Workforce Network that is co chaired by Women in Global Health and the World Health Organization. She is a Belgian by birth, but is better known as a Caribbean trade unionist, having started off her career with the National Union of Public Workers in Barbados then moving on to the Commonwealth Trade Union Council and now sits as the sub-regional secretary for the Caribbean with PSI. Sandra is an alumni of the Commonwealth Study Conference and she serves as a member of the Barbados Committee and Steering Committee for the Caribbean-Canada Emerging Ladies Dialogue. So I want to welcome Comrade Sandra Messiah to this discussion. And um, let me introduce in more detail uh, Comrade Claudette Etnel as well. Claudette is currently the Vice Chairman of the Trade Union C47. She works in the Ministry of Labor as head of the cooperative department and also serves as a member of the Labor Advisory Board within the ministry as the trade union representative. She teaches at the SIVIS Suriname Labor College in the areas of cooperative and trade unions and occupational safety, health, and the environment. She's president of five unions in various sectors. Claudette juggles these responsibilities with also being a mother of three and a grandmother of four. And so what we want to do is to take the presentations of all of the participants um, and the viewers are free to um, send in questions. Uh, we will pull the questions for the um, end of the discussion after we've heard from each of the participants. What we would like to do is um, follow the order of having Comrade Andre of the CCL start off um, so that we have no interruptions when we get to the more lovely um, participants on the on the panel. Um, so, you know, beauty will come last, comrade. So I want to open the floor now to comrade Andrew Lewis, who will talk about the Grenadian experience of um, the COVID-19 pandemic, and also maybe some of what he has heard from other affiliates of the CCL throughout the region. Uh, comrade Lewis, please. The floor is yours. Yes, comrades. Thank you very much um, for having us here this afternoon. 
this move by the Alma Franco Institute must be highly commended. And we hope and do believe that this is just a start of many more informative discussions aimed at coming up with solutions to be implemented as we go forward in addressing the peoples of the region problems and concerns. To my comrades, Comrade Masaya and Ethnel, once again, good afternoon, and to the listening public, to Comrade Ian and Atkins and others from Cipriani, good afternoon. As Comrade Ian indicated, I will sort of um, give the Grenadian experience. All the most times you will not be here in Grenada because our discussions show the region, our involvement show the region has indicated that you can substitute the name Grenada and put Barbados, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Cayman, Bermuda. And apart from a few nuances in terms of dates as to when certain things are implemented, the general experiences are the same, except in, in, in Barbados and, and the Bahamas, where there were a greater involvement of the labor movement from day one with the government in terms of trying to set policies in response to COVID-19. Comrades, as we said at the Caribbean Congress of Labor, I'm as pleased to be part of this discussion. And workers' rights are not quarantined. And in the Grenada experience, we on May 2020, 1st of May, International Workers' Day, we ensured that workers, what made it was not locked down or made it was not shut down. So in the Grenada experience, we had different addresses from the different um, unions and even the Minister for Labor, as would have traditionally been done in the past, but only this time it was done virtually. And we were able to bring across our messages, one of hope, one of analysis of the existing conditions to our members, because it is extremely important in this period to hold on to our sanity and to identify the issues that are valuable for us to ensure that we do not lose sight of those. So in Grenada, media was not locked down, and media was not shut down. There's absolutely no doubt that the global pandemic, COVID-19, has really shaken up the world, and in particular, the established working relations, the way that we are accustomed to operating. We see in the region that governments have more or less followed a similar approach to regulating the operations and activities of the citizenry. This is true in Grenada, as I've said, so in many, many instances, I'm going to um, regionalize it. Um, in most cases, the governments have continued to form to, of restrictions, have continued to form of restrictions on civil liberties. In Grenada, we have the state of emergency as is existing in most um, of the regional islands. We have now currently moved to a state where the state of emergency and the restrictions of individual a curfew now runs from 7 p.m. to 5 a.m. 7 p.m. in the evening to 5 a.m. in the morning. But during the day from 5 to 7, a number of activities are allowed um, to be performed. And this state of emergency in Grenada, as it was in the region, has been designed to limit and control the activities and movement of individuals in keeping with what has been designed of achieving the physical distancing and to curtail or prevent the contracting and or spreading of COVID-19. We have also had our closed borders. We have seen an, it is now mandatory in, for the wearing of masks once in public, once in a transport. Um, you are not allowed to sit on the side of each other, but you have to be staggered and on opposite sides. There is restrictions on the beach, which has now been sort of lifted. As of yesterday um, in Grenada, 
one can visit the beach during the hours of, I think it is 7 to 11. They cannot be visit to anyone in the hospitals. So when you have a sick one in the hospital or not, you cannot visit that, and that's for health reason. We have seen a closure of schools, the limited amount, amount of business hours, and in the closure of schools, we are now in the process of um, e-learning. That has had its negative impact, which is necessary in terms of the e-learning, but it clearly shows the inequalities within our society again, where a number of people do not have the means to, to utilize e-learning, be the equipment, be it in the form of a computer or a laptop, or having Wi-Fi or the internet. And in cases where you may have access to Wi-Fi or the internet, you may have two or three children in the same household and having to compete for one equipment. And it therefore means that a number of students will be getting left in a period like now. The restrictions on public transportation means that even in the industries that are allowed to function, a number of workers are finding it extremely difficult to report to work. Although the state has said that part of the condition for allowing businesses to function is that the employer has to provide transport. Some instances, employers are not providing transport. In some instances, they are making it known to the employees that they have to find themselves to work. Even in the case of teachers who have to operate from at home, you have had cases where teachers have to log on at 8.30. It is required to log on to 8.30, despite the fact that on those business days, teachers, as any other parent or any other citizen, have to go and compete to get certain services. And having children themselves, kids at home, it makes it extremely difficult. The, also, the aspect of transportation means that some businesses are not able to have the full complements, even if they can have the full complements of the workforce. But even where they require the full complements, the aspect of the physical distances makes it almost impossible at the moment to operate with a full complement. We, we see the closing of hotels and restaurants. And what is interested in Grenada, as in the Caribbean region too? Traditionally in Grenada, the hotel industry has been the golden boys, or the golden people, boys and women, boys and girls of our society. They were the ones that have traditionally benefited from tourism. Some of the workers are the lowest paid, but yet still the state found it necessary to, in terms of a stimulus package, to target the, the hotel industry. And in the construction and other um, areas within the country, they have not been fortunate so far as to be considered for the stimulus package. We have seen in Grenada and the rest of the region in some islands the unilateral approach of the state and employers to apply wo workers' own annual vacation leave to the days that were locked down, the days that workers were not allowed to, to leave the yard. The employers have, with the, with the encouragement of the state, seek to apply workers' annual vacation leave to those days. We, we, we have opposed that and we have called for discussions to be held, but um, for the workers who are not unionized, uh, it has been applied in a number of instances. The regulatory approval restrictions have restricted the traditional engagement of the union with the workers. In most instances, the state has excluded the union in discussions and these Limitations, because a number of unions, we have to be frank, very frank about it, um, were not prepared as no one has been prepared for COVID-19, but did not have, in some instances, the use of social media platforms with their members that's created a challenge for a number of unions to maintain contact um, with, with, with their members. We have, we have seen the unions have had to be in the struggling for inclusion in the same discussions in order to ensure that this, um, whatever positive changes that may be put in place, we have to ensure as unions that we engage in those discussions. And we in the labor movement, we in the CCL and the labor movement have called on our affiliates um, for direct involvement in these discussions. 
we have raised with the different leaders and in one of our recent discussions, we have raised with two um, CARICOM prime ministers, namely Prime Minister Mia Motley out of Barbados and Prime Minister Shastina from out of St. Lucia, the need for direct involvement and calling upon them to take a position within CARICOM to insist upon the respective territories to have the labor movement involved. We have had to take an approach in Grenada, and I, as I said, the Ryder region too, where the aspect of the preservation of jobs is extremely important. There is a mantra that half a loaf is better than none. And therefore, it is important to hold on to jobs, which sometimes call for the um, flexibility and the compromising on some of the benefits that we will have enjoyed. So in Grenada, for instance, there are some workplaces where we have had to agree through discussion because of the restriction in the working hours to give up on overtime, what will normally be overtime, in exchange for the guaranteeing of the basic salary of workers. So for instance, at the St. George's University in Grenada, we have a commitment from that university, which is one of the, it is the largest private sector employer in Grenada, represented by the Technical and Allied Workers Union. And these workers are guaranteed the basic pay until June, July. And that is in a case where most of the workers are not reporting to work. So in a case where most of the workers are not reporting to work and the workers who are reporting we have had to go into discussions with the university, which we think is fair, to be frank with you. This is a, something that calls for the collective good. So that even if in cases where some workers may work one hour overtime or so, we will be asking our members to forego that overtime, but to be paid their basic wage. So that whether if you work one day in the, in the month, if you work half day in the month, you are guaranteed your basic pay. Um, so we are in discussions with the university because we also think it will be fair where a worker works for a whole month, there must be consideration to, for that worker to be paid over time if he or she works over time. So it is not just a catch blank approach of the giving up of overtime or the giving up of allowances, but we are certain minimum conditions in which we are asking workers not to apply for certain benefits or allowances that they would have enjoyed in exchange for ensuring that your brothers and sisters in the wider workforce who are not gainfully employed will be guaranteed their basic pay. So this is what some of the trade-offs that we have looked at here, certainly in Grenada. Um, we have also looked at where there is no collective agreement, because our concern in Grenada and in the region, CCL in the region, and Grenada, Trade Union Council. It's not just about the unionized, but also the non-unionized workers. And our call has been for legislations to be put in place, even if of a sunset nature, to, to govern the employer-employee relationship in a period like now, where there ought to be certain flexibilities. So, for instance, as a typical example, we think it is absolutely necessary that where there'll be cases of layoff, rotation, and possible retrenchment as a last resort, that there must be guiding principle, the aspect of fairness. So last in, first out, where all conditions are the same. And the guaranteeing of that employer to the employee that once conditions change, that employee would be recalled with no loss of benefits. As we move to where the... Governments are uh, looking to lift restrictions or continue to lift restrictions. We must ensure that people's lives and health comes first. So that even if there are more ec economic activities, which is important, it must not be at a compromise of health and safety. And therefore, the aspect of occupational safety and health takes on more significance in this period. The employer has a responsibility to get the employee to the job. The employer has a responsibility to provide proper protective equipment. The state has a responsibility together with the union and the employer. And this is where um, social um, dialogue and tripartitism comes into place to 
ensure that we overlook and oversee those, those things. But also, we have been calling on our members and all workers. The aspect of your safety starts with you. You have that responsibility to ensure that you make use of the protective equipment that have been provided to you and instances where they now be provided to bring it out to our attention. So the Grenada Trades Union Council has made it publicly known that any worker, unionized or not, belonging to any of our affiliates or not, can depend on us for advice in a period like now. We did so in the past. In Grenada, interestingly enough, um, we give representation to workers walking off the street. We even go to the Ministry of Labor and we do not charge anyone. We, we, we have not operated like this. And we have made it known that we are, are prepared to give our service up to these members. We have called on the beefing up of the Ministry of Labor, that the government must use resources to beef up the Ministry of Labor, because there will be more demands on the Ministry of Labor to ensure that the proper procedures and protocols are in place at the workplaces that are not unionized. What is the importance of that? It is also selfish for the state. Why? Because proper pro procedures and protocol will ensure that we can better contain COVID-19. And we have done a reasonably well job in the Caribbean region um, so far, in our immediate um, region as compared to North America. So the workplace must be made as safe as possible. We must ensure that there is a rebalancing of the jobs. There's absolutely no doubt that in Grenada and the wider Caribbean, traditionally, we as a society look down on some jobs, be it sanitation workers, be it the, the, the cleaners in the hospital, the street cleaners, the, the, the cooks at the hospital, the grocery store workers, etc. We have traditionally looked down on them. And if we are in doubt about this, all that we need to do is to look at the wages. They have been the most lowly paid workers. And it may be surprising to some of you to note, but seeing Grenada, and I will not be surprised if this is the case in the wider Caribbean region, that our hoteliers, who have been some of our most wealthy entrepreneurs, whom in some instances the state have invested more in, in terms of marketing our islands, some of our rest, hotel workers are some of the lowest paid workers. And therefore, we must, in going forward, we must rebalance. We must ensure that we rebalance the value and worth of these jobs. And therefore, we as a labor movement, and not just as a labor movement, but all those who are mindful and concerned about the plight of workers and about the plight of our society to live the standard of living of our people, have a responsibility to ensure that we do the necessary research and come up with the necessary platform to, to add value to these jobs. It is something that is not just the domain in our view of the labor movement. We need the professionals to assist us uh, because in most cases, um, quite a number of trade unions do not have the resources, the economic resources to hire the relevant um, professionals. And here, CPRNI can also assist in, in, in identifying the, 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 the relevant qualified individuals that can assist us with this professional work. We need professionals who have that heart for workers to be engaged in these discussions and, and, and together the labor movement and the wider society as needed, put together that, that value um, to these jobs. So as we make those changes, that's what we need to address. And I want to propose as a means of solidarity in the region that those of us who are discussing now, the the public private sector and all of us as trade unionists and the progressive movement as i will call it generally come up at some stage with a day that we can um note throughout the caribbean region beat the 10th of august i just use that date as an example that we will declare a solidarity with workers throughout the region and in particular the frontline workers and not just the frontline workers but the frontline workers who have traditionally been looked down upon Right? Where we make a demand with one voice, the necessary work ought to be done up front, but with one voice at that day, in whatever form we decide upon, um, what we call a minimum wage for these workers. And this minimum wage is not a traditional minimum wage that is existing in some islands. But that, 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 that minimum wage must be comparable right, to the other traditionally 
high paying jobs that we have looked at, be the technicians in our different telecommunication companies, be the technicians in our, our electricity companies, right? And in our administrative um, jobs or in our service sectors. So we, that is something I'm proposing for us to look at as a regional solidarity um, coming up. And the objective, we must ensure that COVID-19 does not end up being contained and we move to another stage and leaving those workers behind. We would have, we would have paid too much a heavy price with the loss of lives and the sickness that we'd have gone through and continue to go through. Not just in the region, not just in Grenada and the region, because we are impacted with what takes place in North America. We, Grenada has lost over 50 something people in the United States, the UK and Canada. I'm sure this is likewise throughout the region. And we would have suffered too much to not ensure that at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that our traditionally looked down upon workers um, are not being treated better. Not with handouts. Not with handouts. We also need to ensure that our healthcare system is being paid attention to. Traditionally, our governments have turned a blind eye to, to healthcare. Our agriculture must be looked into, and our agricultural workers must be given a better remuneration. We need to put technology to agriculture, so we need to have food security in this period and going forward. And move away from the traditional view that agriculture was something that our foreparents did to give us a better education today, and we have turned our backs on it. So we need to revamp this and um, use tourism in whatever form to ensure that we can get resources to be pumped into agriculture. And we have been pushing for that in Grenada and the wider Caribbean, and to use agriculture as intersectorial link, linkages so that we can go into manufacturing and traditional um, arts and craft can find expression through tourism and people Comrade, can turn in, in to a local up, I'm wrapping, yes. In wrapping up, uh, uh, could I ask you to, to um, say how well or, uh, you know, what, what the, the overall grade um, would be for the way that Grenada and the other um, affiliate regions that you've been involved in have done with the outbreak? As it relates to the outbreak, I will give the region and Grenada in particular, to be frank with you, um, A, um, that's Grenada with the outbreak. We have contained, as we look around, um, very um, well, um, relatively speaking, in Grenada, we haven't had any debt. Um, we have most of our people are out of the hospital. Most have recovered. However, I'm saying so also cautiously recognizing that we need to have more testing done. Uh, we need to have more testing done. So I'm just doing with the, with the data before us. Yeah. Although I have some doubts, but with the data before us, I think we did exceedingly well. And we cannot lose, we cannot lose sight of that. Um, despite the fact that the labor movement was not involved in discussion, we supported the actions of the government. So much so that we said no pain, no gain. We, so, we supported what was seen as draconian measures. We thought it was important. Uh, not all the region did the same in St. Vincent. There was a different approach. And the, the result is almost similar to Grenada. So different approach were taken. And I give kudos to, to what has been done and in Grenada. Um, but there are a number of short area, short comments that we have seen because we figured that um, some of the, the, the restrictions were not lifted in a very organized way. And we think that, that there was a misstep that the Ministry of Health and the minister in particular had declared victory over COVID. And it reminded me in particular and a number of us of when George Bush stood on that battleship and declared victory in a war against Iraq. And that war is still going on today. Okay, I'm sure uh, that at the end of the, our presentations, we'll come back to analyzing uh, the strengths and weaknesses of our approaches and, and in particular the impact on workers um, in our societies. Um, so in order, or as the screen has it, I'd like to ask Sister Claudette Etnel um, to make her presentation. Yes, good evening, everybody, comrades. Um, brother 
chairman from CCL, Mr. Andrew Lewis, my sister Sandra, glad to see you again, even if it is on <laughs> social media, but I'm glad to see you as usual, and Mr. Ian, our moderator. It's a privilege for me to be in this panel and to discuss the, uh, discuss the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, what it has meant for Suriname, in particular the workers in Suriname. Let me start by saying that at first, when we heard that there was a pandemic, we weren't so alarmed. But after we got confronted with one victim, that's when people start getting panicking. And that's when government took measures in hand. We, as the union, trade union in Suriname, got an invitation from the president to discuss some the situation. But uh, it was a brief announcement of to tell us as the unions that there will be measures taken. And the unions thought that we were had we are having an uh, invitation from the president to talk about the taxes because we're fighting some the we're fighting to have our taxes, uh, lower taxes for the income wages. But okay, um, that was a brief, a brief announcement, as I said. Um, what, we were, what we saw is that uh, the Minister of Labor, together with the Minister of Health, um, put in a bit of government, put in a COVID team, COVID-19 team. And I must say, the team did a very well, a very good job. We were very proud of them because uh, we had 10 victims, one died, but the one that died wasn't a Surinamese, it was an, a foreigner. And uh, sorry, the one that died was a Surinamese, but um, what we have is that we had 10 uh, COVID victims and everybody got cured. So right now we can say that Suriname is COVID free and we like to keep it that way also. And what was the impact on the working force? If you look at the public sector, the public sector was the first uh, workers that stayed at home for like the, you say, an, uh, yes, they stayed at home like seven to 12 they work and they had a relation working hour, relation day of days. They could come in like one day and they can come in like another day. So what we had also is that the government tried to make sure that the public sector, where it is that they need to work with uh, clients, then we see, look at the, uh, no, the, how you call it, the offices that are in need to have people that come in to pay their dues and so on. Those people were very uh, protected. Uh, measurements were taken in place. They could only enter, three people could enter the building. If you have to pay for your water bill, your uh, light electrical bill, pay for other taxes, so on. Going to the bank, it's also that you stand in line outside and the people get in one by one. Of course, taking the necessary precautions or measurements. When we go to the private sector, there we have, that's where the unions came in, very, uh, well organized, I must say it myself, because we ourselves as C47 have 54 affiliated unions. And what we did is that um, together with the employer, we came to some agreements. And those agreements are all um, subtracted from the uh, announcements that the government made by um, telling us what to do. We had to organize some offices. The, this, the social distance of two meters, that's something that we have to kept in, be, be kept in place. Um, people were um, carried from work to home and vice versa. Um, that was the first period of the um, announcement of the government to take medicine in hand. And when um, after the first um, victim, um, the government saw that there were coming more victims were coming in. The government announced a partial lockdown. The partial lockdown is similar like what my brother Andre just told us. Um, people had the lockdown, it was from 6 till 
It was from eight o'clock in the evening till six in the morning. Um, the transportation, the public transportation was, uh, was stopped. So there was a problem how the workers go get to their workplace. And until now, it's still, uh, there are no buses running. And the government is very strict with that because um, people could get some a sue or a bill if they don't answer to what the government is saying. What we have seen is that some employers are working from home. Others are being carried by the um, business transportation. Transportation, they carry them home and they carry them back to work. When things got a bit better, what the government then decided was that uh, people could come back to work, but it would be in a rotation situation. And that is uh, still what is going on until now. Um, what we have now is that um, we have some workforces that people in the health sector, for example, who are, um, so, um, how you call it, they are responsible for the transport of sick people, people uh, with an, um, people who have a uh, disability, they have to have different precautions for those uh, workers. We had to negotiate for that part so that the buses that carry these people will have to have a little transformation. Some of the bus owners would like, uh, would ask for some money to make sure of those transformations, but that didn't happen. So uh, what was decided by government that what all uh, people who are in um, old places, like how you have the, the shelters for old people, why you have shelters for people with a disability, those shelters will be also being locked. And so the schools were locked down too, and um, children shelters. So what you had is that there was no transportation needed anymore to carry these people to these places. What we have seen is that the trade union made sure that uh, these measurements that were taken were also being in the interest of the workers, of course. The PPEs, the personal, personal protective equipments, those were very important. The masks, if necessary, because not everybody wanted to have a mask, but especially the hospital workers, they were well protected. Um, when we had the public transportation shut down, that means that workers stayed at home, and if necessary, they were provided the transportation to pick them up and bring them safely back to their homes. Even when we had the um, lockdown hours from eight till six in the morning, there was some improvisation. But as brother Andrew Lee was also said, um, the challenge that we had there was that some um, employers asked some people who worked, who lived very far to stay at home and the ones who are nearby who could uh, travel by their own transportation and who could get uh, transportation from the workplace had to work longer hours. Of course, what we got, uh, what the challenge was, was that um, we got uh, people who work longer hours and they didn't want to pay the people over hours. So that's where we got in as the union and we negotiated and we told them, listen, if the people cannot uh, work longer hours, have to work longer hours and they cannot get their pay, then we will have to make sure that you will have to find a way to go and get the other people that live far so that they come and do their own job. For now, we see that some of the employers um, could listen to us and some places they even um, came in with um, some flexible working hours. As the government is um, lifting this restriction last week, now it's uh, lockdown time is now 11 in the evening till five in the morning. We still uh, have to look as unions 
how we're going to set in our working force again. But some companies are already trying to get everybody on board again, but taking in consideration the social distance and offices have to be reorganized. So what they're going to do is they're going to try to have a rotation uh, working hour or working shift. Um, the health and safety laws, as we look at the government is lifting the restriction, what we would like to see is as long as there is no cure or vaccine, the safety and health precautions should be well lifted by the workers. The workplace code of safety must be obeyed. The collective agreement must be based on the Safety and Health Act on COVID. The entire office or workplace must be organized in such a way that the social distance is being kept, hand sanitizers, et cetera, et cetera, everything that you need to have your uh, COVID-19 um, on the cover. Unions must build awareness among workers to stay safe at all times. The employer and the union together must keep a healthy and safe workplace and environment. The solidarity actions in the regions is that we as trade unions in the Caribbean must be updated with the well-being of our comrades. We must stay in contact through social media on what the status is in each other countries. We must interact in sharing solutions and precautions taken to the fight, taken to fight COVID-19. We need to stay in contact and be aware of what is going on in the region and of course also abroad so that we know what to do and how to think. And um, I also put it in place when I saw that Brother Lois was there, that this will be a very, very important role for the CCL also. And together, we have must act together. We cannot say it's the CCL alone, we must act together, that we can stay safe and that we can think that COVID-19 is over until it's over. Thank you. Comrade Andre, in his discussion, uh, spoke to the way in which the uh, pandemic exposed some of the issues of inequality in the society. Um, I wonder if that is the occurrence, if that is the, the experience in Suriname as well, from your point of view. Um, can you repeat that for me again, please? Um, during his presentation, Comrade Andre spoke about the issue of inequalities, which were being uh, shown up on earth by the pandemic itself. Um, so, so inequalities actually seem to make the, the effect of the pandemic worse. Um, is that the, the experience in Suriname? Well, let me say this, in Suriname, when we had, we had the inequality, of course, in the beginning, but we were very fast thanks to the COVID team that we had input by government. And we had some places, some neighborhoods where people were, yeah, like, they don't care because they didn't have the awareness of what this COVID means, what it could uh, uh, do to them. But uh, thank God that is now, let's say, in place because every afternoon we have the COVID team for an hour on the television, giving us all kinds of instructions and all kinds of uh, updates, how to take care and how to be careful. And I must say until now, uh, we can say they did a pretty good job. I gave them a nine. Thank you very much, uh, Claudette Ethnel. Um, so we want to turn the floor over to Sindra, uh, Sister Sandra Messiah for her to um, make her presentation. Sister Sandra. Great. Thank you all very much. And, and in the interest of, of continuing along with the, the, the pattern that has been set by my, my two colleagues. First of all, to thank um, the Alma Francois Institute. Um, I think that this is actually an excellent um, follow through on the discussions that we had in August last year. Um, and certainly it, it says that having had that discussion during your Caribbean Workers Forum, this is a practical um, enactment of what that kind of a discussion and, and interaction can bring about. Um, I'd like to focus my discussions mainly on situations regarding the 
COVID-19 and understanding that this is a public health crisis. And as many of you are aware, PSI, Public Services International, represents those workers who deliver public services. And I am particular in saying it that way because it's not necessarily only in the public sector, but we're talking about public services, whether they're delivered through government agencies, quasi-agencies, government departments, or even in the case of the private sector. Um, I, I, I go by this view that a crisis is too good a thing to waste. Um, we've got this crisis that, as I said before, is a public health crisis. And I'd like to take us back to almost a year ago. A year ago, we were talking about the future of work. We were talking about the ILO centenary, the conference, the declaration, the, the work of the Global Commission. And one key thing stood out in terms of all those discussions. And I think we need to, you know, refocus on it. It's a human-centered agenda. I believe in the first um, session of the series, Brother Anaset reminded everyone that we're talking about putting people over profit. In fact, that is PSI's slogan. And in that report, Work for a Brighter Future, there is a proposal that a human-centered agenda for the future of work must be in place, and it must be one that strengthens the social contract where we're placing people and the work they do at the center of economic and social policy and business. The ILO Centenary Declaration also reaffirmed a number of statements and, and declarations throughout the ILO's 100 years. And some people have been saying that this is something that cannot be predicted. No one could have predicted it. We, it came upon us very suddenly. And actually, that's not true. In September last year, a grouping prepared a report called The World at Risk. And if you permit me to read a sentence from it, the central finding of the report is that the world needs to proactively establish the systems needed to detect and control potential disease outbreaks. These acts of preparedness are a global public good that must meaningfully engage communities from the local to the international in preparedness, detection, response, and recovery. Sisters and brothers, we all know that prevention is better than cure, but we've been taught, we've been, it's been hammered into us by um, a number of agencies that really should know better that we need to cut. We need to cut everything. And we've cut spending on public health. We've cut the spending on services through public service delivery. So we've cut the numbers of people to deliver the services. We've cut the kind of resources that we need. And therefore, we're ending up in a situation where the world generally was just not properly prepared to deal with this pandemic. I want to look at it from three aspects, before the crisis, during the crisis, and after the crisis. And in all situations, we have to be looking at it from challenges and opportunities. Uh, my colleagues before me have given you a, a kind of an overview of some of the things that have been happening across the Caribbean. And I think we can say that thanks to a regional approach, we can hold our heads up high because it kind of reaffirms that solid belief that we can achieve things collectively. Um, our affiliates have re been reporting a number of instances where obviously they've had to step in with regard to PPE provision, um, and not just PPE generally, but the right PPE, um, things in relation to working conditions generally and so on. But what happens after the crisis? How are we preparing for this post-COVID world? And I'd like to put a little bit more emphasis on that in my presentation. Um, so after the crisis, will we still um, have some of these challenges? Will we have overcome at least some of them? 
And will we be taking advantage of the opportunities? Um, we've had a number of health crises worldwide. We've had Ebola, Zika. We've had um, the SARS, which are a variant of, of, of COVID-19. But yet we seem to be repeating the same mistakes. We seem to be going back to things as usual. We're continually saying we can't go back to the what people call the normal, but yet we still seem to be going there. There are things like technology, the digital economy, the digital revolution, or education systems and practices don't seem to be keeping pace. We have poor social protection systems generally. Um, the, the, the kind of responses that our governments have had to put in place have shown that not only in terms of what has been legislated in various countries, but actually what people themselves understand as social protection. And certainly it has shown that the private sector doesn't do what it is supposed to do. How then can we say that they must lead any future development? We've seen the attacks on social dialogue and social partnership systems. But hey, we've got a little glimmer of hope because we do have a number of our colleagues across the Caribbean who have been invited to participate in these task forces and these committees to discuss the post-COVID and insert whatever country's name you want to put there. We've got issues of food security. And, and this thing that is called national security. But I actually would prefer to talk about issues related to migration. We've got the, the, the situation where when it, it, it was revealed, and, and I'm not talking about when it was declared a pandemic, because that's, that's just a declaration. I'm talking about when it was indicated that it is an epidemic of serious international concern, it was confusion, panic, despair, um, many of us still have feelings of overwhelm and, and there's a lack of focus or communication systems and practices were kind of all over the place. And I'm not only talking about governments and employers, I'm talking about the trade union movement as well. Um, I found that dealing with a number of our affiliates because of this confusion and panic and overwhelm, they seem to forgot that their role was to apply the principles that make us who we are. No one was asking trade unions to come up with a vaccine. What we are there to do is to apply our principles of democracy, solidarity, independence, decent work agenda, social protection systems, people-centered approach, and the list goes on to situations that are happening or could happen in a COVID-19 situation. And it certainly has led us now to recognize this genuine social dialogue and social partnership and what it means. Um, Brother Andre referred to the fact that there are some countries where governments did not fully engage with the trade union movement. And whenever I hear that, I always ask the question, why? Is it that they don't see us in that light of engaging in discussions on the development of countries and economies and societies? Or is it that they only see us in relation to what is seen as the usual labor issues, wages, salaries, and whether you've got a lunchroom or vacation pay and things like that? Are, are we preparing ourselves to meaningfully engage in genuine social dialogue and social partnership? We've heard about these post-COVID-19 task forces, and in particular, in the case of Trinidad and Tobago and in Jamaica, where we've got some of our, our rather strong affiliates who are, are involved in this. And we've actually decided to work with them to make sure that we have a single voice. So whether the government and the private sector or, or general global, um, sorry, general civil society speaks to us, we're saying the same things. That we're, we're actually setting up some meetings with our re various representatives in these post-COVID task forces to make sure that the things we want to see, uh, in other words, a transformed Trinidad and Tobago, Curacao, Suriname, Grenada, and the list goes on. In other words, a transformed world becomes a reality. We have to talk about solidarity. 
And it's not just solidarity within a country, it's regional cooperation, linking and working um, cooperatively and collectively with CARICOM, the OECS and other regional groupings, and also an understanding that multilateralism must be boosted. We can't be talking about only ourselves. In the case of technology and data and intelligence, we also have to give our thoughts to how are we going to be advising our members about dealing with, how are we going to engage in the discussions with governments and employers generally about the use of technology? Sadly, a number of people seem to be thinking that the answer to COVID, contact tracing and so on, is found in technology. No, it's not. Technology is just a tool. And if we aren't in there from day one to be talking about it, who owns the data, who controls the data, who governs the use of the data, we're going to find ourselves, if not back in the same situation as we were in in November 2019, perhaps even in a, a worse situation. What is the future of work? I think this brings home that question even more in a, in a post-COVID-19 situation. And what is the role of public services? Our, our view within Public Services International is centered on one, recognizing that this is a public health emergency when we're talking about the immediacy of COVID-19. But even more than that, it's talking about the austerity measures that have been put in place worldwide that have reduced public services. And our slogan, our campaign, is that safe workers save lives. Many of our workers, you're hearing the term frontline workers, essential workers, and I do have a problem with that essential workers. All workers are essential. We can't live without work, work in, of various forms. But when we talk about the fundamental frontline workers, the healthcare and social services workers, the bus drivers, the court services, those who are in mass transportation, um, people who are dealing with the climate, um, those who are in correctional services, water and sanitation, communications, emergency services, and the list goes on, then it says to us that if we want to get things done in a post-COVID society, we need the workers. But many governments have been laying off public workers. And sad to say, it may even be that though they're now talking about everybody is essential, it may very well come to that based on some recommendations from you know who, the World Bank and the IMF, and even some of our regional banks who take the cue from them. We have a situation too about universal public health. We're talking about health care, but it seems to have gone to the wayside. I'm not sure that we are actually digging into the roots of this. And if we had proper health care systems that were well resourced, where the workers in the healthcare and social care services, and indeed many of these frontline fundamental workers were given the necessary training and tools and also valued, maybe just maybe we wouldn't be in this position. And please allow me to deal with a particular issue, the gender dimensions of this virus, which sadly it seems very few people want to deal with. Yes, everybody has been affected, but hey, the workers that are these essential ones that we keep talking about, the sanitation workers, the workers in the retail stores, the groceries, the supermarkets, the cleaners, all those workers, and predominantly, not only are they the ones who are delivering public services, but they're women. Women whose role, whose work has been undervalued. And yes, we do need to be talking about their wages and salaries, but their wages and salaries from the point of view of having a proper job evaluation system put in place, starting with the public sector and maybe starting to within that public sector, within health and social services and education, 
that properly values the work, the care work that women do. If nothing else, we owe it to those members of society and their families to transform this world, to transform the societies. We shouldn't be talking about minimum wage. We shouldn't be talking even about hazard pay. We should be talking about valuing their work and giving it the proper value it deserves to be had in our various countries and societies. One of, one of the questions that the organizers asked me um, was in this time where restrictions are being lifted, um, what are some of the measures that I would like to see put in place? I think it's important, first of all, if I look at it from internal to the trade union movement, internal to our unions, we have to beef up our skills and knowledge in order to come up with our charter of what we want to see in place. So that whether the Minister of Labor in Grenada or the minister responsible for the blue economy in Barbados or the minister responsible for tourism in the Bahamas speaks to us, we're saying the same thing. That is, we want to ensure that there's investment in public services and especially in public health. That we review, and we have to be bold about this, we have to review our taxation systems. I heard Sister Claudette talking about having concerns where, where people wanted to pay less taxes. Well, if you want to pay less taxes and the corporations are hiding and not paying their taxes, where will the investment come from to provide the services that we are now saying are essential? We can't be saying they're essential and expect that they're going to be paid for out of the sky. We're going to have to make some bold decisions and some bold choices. And we're going to have to be, you know, doing some serious introspections, not only when it comes to our discussions with governments, but discussions among ourselves. Sisters and brothers, it is because we have a function in CARICOM. It's not perfect, by no means. But we do have a function in CARICOM that we are able, in some ways, to raise our heads and say, well, you know what? We ain't do too bad in this COVID thing. It ain't as bad as. But in a case like this, one situation, any one situation in any one country where someone and their family, the immediate and extended, is adversely affected by a public health crisis, means that something is seriously and drastically wrong. And yes, we can talk and sing and whatever and pray and have thoughts and prayers. But if we don't take some bold action, if we don't take the lead as the trade union movement, if we don't take the bull by the horns, we won't have those safe workers who will save our lives. I hope that that covers um, most of what you'd ask me to. And I look forward to further discussion. Yes, uh, Sister Sandra, that was a very compelling um, presentation. I was getting the wind up signal, um, but I uh, unilaterally decided it was going too good to, to be disturbed. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to ask uh, one question of you before we go back to the, the other participants. Um, given uh, Ebola, Zika, SARS, and all of the other pandemics that have occurred in recent time, almost one upon the other, uh, given um, the, the austerity measures that we've been seeing of, around the world. I saw an article that suggested that the uh, austerity measures, as you argued, gutted the British response, ability to respond to, um, to COVID-19 as well. Is it really a, a public health emergency or an income distribution, government policy, uh, uh, social inequality um, uh, uh, emergency? It is a public health emergency because it is because of public health um, 
uh, the lack of investment in public health mm -hmm. that has brought all of these other things into play and has actually shone the light on the inequalities that we face. And public health, and, and I think in the Caribbean, we're, we're always also fancy to talk about, um, oh, the health is the wealth of the nation and so on. And, and that in itself tells us that anything that affects the health of your nation is going to show up all the other aspects of your society that are not actually working well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Sister Eknal, I see you. Were you going to join in? Yes, I wanted to say to Sandra, Sandra mentioned uh, that about the Texas, when we talked about um, lower taxes because on the salaries and we also thought about that uh sandra from where all the government get their other um how you call it tax uh, things to pay to make sure that everything goes well in the country so we talked about the sale tax the entertainment taxes the real estate taxes they should put those things in place and of course you have some high and mighty um capitalists who don't even pay taxes so I think they will have to go and get those taxes from those people so that they can provide so that we as workers, when we get an increase in salary, cannot pay too much tax because what will you will, uh, will, will you be your, your netto budget? That's what we we're, we're talking about. Both ways. We yes. Can have it both ways. Yes. We can have it both ways, but we can negotiate about it because that's what we were trying to do. Okay. <laughs> um, just to come back to the issue of, of inequalities that that um, comrade um, Andrew raised as a, as a critical part um, of his discussion, uh, we, we are talking about a post-COVID world. Is there such a thing, a post-COVID world? We are, as you pointed out, uh, Sister Sandra, the, we, the pandemics are almost predictable. So, you know, um, and the investments in, in um, public health and in public services have been slashed in, in recent times. Uh, Comrade Andre talked about the number of people who are not placed um, to, to deal with what we are calling the post-COVID world. Um, so, so is there a post-COVID world? How do we craft that post-COVID world, especially in relation um, to the working people of the region? Okay. Um, um, when we talk about how people have to spend their money, we're, we're, we're going to put aside how much money that is for the time being. But when you have a situation, and I'm linking it to inequalities, and, and I also want to link it to human rights. When you have a situation where Joanne Simpson, who lives in Coco Reet, who has two young children, she's working in Charlotte Street, and she has to make a choice between getting medication for her dependents or her children, paying the rent and buying food, then what, what kind of what kind of human rights we talking about that exists? What kind of democracy we talking about that exists? And in a post-COVID world or post-pandemic world or or, or a transformed society that puts people at the center of our development or sustainable development. We should be in a situation where those human rights are provided free at the point of delivery that says that that money that she has can then be really and truly put to what she would really love to be able to do. No one should have to choose between buying medicine and buying food, but that's the situation a lot of our people are in because we do not have universal public health coverage. The, the answer being given by insurance companies that are telling governments what to do is okay, well, people can buy into an insurance plan. 
but the kind of insurance plan that you buy into depends on how much money you you have to buy into it the choice is still not a fair choice and if we're saying that health is a human right education is a human right is it only a human right for some humans so there must be a post-covid world there are some people who are actually living a post-covid world who can fly in their private jet and go to a little island and get away from it i understand that some of those little islands are in our neck of the woods but that's another discussion but um there is a post-covid world and we should all be able to enjoy such a post-COVID world, a world in which, yes, is everything isn't going to be perfect, but be jinx, it got to be better than what we're dealing with now. And again, I want to emphasize this thing about looking at the gender dimensions of it. When we're talking about all those workers, those hotel workers who are now without a job, the majority of them are, again, women who then have responsibilities for immediate and extended families. And if we don't talk about inequalities and inequalities in their true sense, we are not really going to be dealing with issues. We have to be bold, we have to be in some cases vicious, and we have to challenge a lot of the things that we've come to see as, oh, well, that's the way things are. If we don't make the changes now, if we aren't bold, we can go through this whole thing again, put in plaster, and sore. Mm -hmm. Sister Edna, Sister Edna, do you have any comments? Well, it's a good point that Sandra is making there, as usual. And uh, <laughs> but I have to tell you, it's uh, the post-COVID world. Yes, it's already started, and Sandra, it is already there. So even if the government is trying to put. Um, bring in some food packages, um, old age provisions and so on, um, it will still be a, how to say, sorry, a big challenge for us to see how we're gonna deal with this post-COVID world. Because indeed people now are suffering, people cannot make ends meet, they don't know how they're gonna survive. What will we do to help them to get out of this situation? It will be a crisis for us to think about. And I'm sure that we will all have to bend our head to see what we can do. For now, our government has given us uh, some of the people that, as I say, uh, some food packages, um, some uh, old age provisions are gone in discount uh, leaf, leaf ice or how you call it. And a few, a few measurements the government uh, gave in. But now we have another problem because where are they gonna get the money? Are we gonna print money? <laughs> so you know what is gonna happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brother Andre. Okay, um, uh -huh. tell me. In the situation that you were discussing, where you was you were um, emphasizing the importance of protecting workers. Um, during this this pandemic condition, how how do we we ensure that, as Sister Sandra said, that workers are brought along into this post um, pandemic world? Well, let me say, um, Comrade Sandra, um, I think we need to do a little deep dive in. Probably not much deep, but um, I'm absolutely confident that the labor movement has the necessary resources intellectually, organizationally, to be a value to the government in terms of charting the way forward and for its engagement. They have taken a deliberate decision to leave us out because obviously they want to do things unilaterally. And because some, most of the things that you have spoken about a caring government, and I'm using the word caring here sort of loosely, um, these are not things that we ought to be fighting for. And some of the indications of our ability, academically, intellectually, organizationally, by the very fact that quite a number of our regional leaders over the years, both at the level of government and the, even in the private sector, have come up to the trade union movement, the ranks of the trade union movement, and have been some of the leading voices 
for workers over the years. Yes, um, so we have that. What, and I'll give you one practical example. In Grenada, and I'm sure this is the juice, could be seen throughout the region. Whenever there is a national crisis, where the sacrifice of workers are needed more and more, that is where the governments involve the labor movements. So for instance, in Grenada, during the period 2014 to 2016, you know, structural adjustment program, when we needed the blessing of the World Bank and the IMF, who insisted that you needed to have social involvement, social dialogue of the wider community, and therefore the labor movement did not give the okay, the assistance that we got may not have comfort, the government embraced us. Yes, they embraced us, not at the beginning, but close to the beginning as much as is possible. We are involved in the Committee of Social Partners that have not been meeting in um, crisis time, because in our view, the government does not want to hear the voices of so, um, civil society and the labor movement when they want to do their own thing. We are involved in the monitoring committee, the committee that will have monitored the performance of the structural adjustment program. The labor movement was involved and wider civil society. Um, so we, we have that ability. Um, the question of public spending. I, I'm a, in agreement with you, but with a slight twist. I don't think that, certainly in Grenada's case, and I will have a guess, um, to the region, they have been decreasing public spending. I think the decrease have come in what we call the organized spending with what we call organized labor, the permanent workforce, because we, we have seen increasing public spending in terms of contract work and what we call political favoritism. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, I just wanted to take up on this where you made a call for an increase in public, where you see decreasing public spending. There have been decreasing public spending in, in terms of what we call organized labor, where, where government could be held accountable for its spending. But, but I think that there have been an increase in public spending overall, but along the, um, the political line. And I'm agreeing with the gender issue, but it is something that we have been calling for in Grenada for quite a while now, for the past years, um, where we have to find that balance because um, we have to discuss the, the aspect of, of gender, both male and female, because our men are in crisis. Eh? And one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why, in our view, that you find quite, albeit yes, in the low paying jobs, and that is part of our historical within which society has looked down on women. Yes, but quite a number of our, our male counterparts have been unemployed because they did not find it necessary. And we as a society have sort of lost track of them in terms of the education. Even if within the education system, you would find that more of our sisters have been involved in, in the learning, in going to school. Quite a number of our, our adult sisters I've been going back in additional classes, but our men, right, um, has just been almost at a waste. Um, and therefore, we need to find that way collectively to address those issues. But I'm agreeing with you that the vast majority of our people in the underpaying jobs and in the jobs that have been traditionally looked down upon have been women. Um, panel, uh, on more than one occasion, um, I've heard the comment that the trade unions were not involved in, in the construction um, of the response to, to the pandemic um, from time to time or in different um, settings. Um, so the, 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 and while we've agreed that the trade unions are, are necessary to, to helping um, to deal with this process and to, to um, be involved in making the step forward into the, the, the next um, paradigm of work, what does it say that about trade unions, not, 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 for, not the, the people who are not looking at us, but about us ourselves in the, in the labor movement that we are, well, so easily, what, put to the side in these processes and something as important as this? Uh, until, if I may jump in here, until we reach the stage, of understanding 
and accept them that the workers make up the majority of our society. And we can use this when the time comes. And I'm going here strictly political, not party politics. Strictly political. Because we cannot absolve ourselves from politics. Politics is our daily life. It is intertwined. Until we in the labor movement um, make it be known that if we are not being listened to, but in order to be listened to, as Comrade Sanja said, we need to develop um, what we call um, a, the, um, a protocol, a workers' platform, a protocol of what we want. We must have demands and be prepared to, 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 to say to the, to the politicians, the frontline politicians, I'm saying here, that if you do not listen to us, our voices, we, we would influence the, the, the outcome of our national elections, to be frank with you, in that direction to those who, who are most sympathetic to us, not just sympathetic, but are prepared to listen to us and have our involvement, we'll continue to have this. Yes, and, and um, we are pushed aside or left aside because sadly enough, um, we are still at a stage in most of our Caribbean islands where, where the bread and butter issue sometimes get consumed in what I call the party politics. So we have a responsibility to ensure that our members understand that bread and butter must be separated from what I call the, the, the party carrying uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. Um, cu couple of things I want to uh, say about this. Um, first and foremost, the people that we have to make sure we are able to influence are not necessarily the governments. It's the general public. Mm -hmm. And if general public ain't with us, <laughs> we will be constantly shouting in that echo chamber and thinking that it is the governments. Governments come and governments go. The one who listened to us when they were in opposition and eventually become the government, we can be fighting the same old battle. Where are our principles? Where, are, where, where, where do we stand with them? And do we really engage the public? Do we really help to ensure that the public understands, appreciates, and supports the positions from which we have sat down and discussed? Are we sure that when our activists go home, and they're talking to their families and their community groups and their whatever, whether they're a member of the Lions Club, the, the local community group, that the same principles and values and thoughts that we have in a union meeting or, or in a webinar about a union matter, are we saying the same things? Are we convincing them that they too become the mouthpieces and therefore that with that surge that we are then able to exact the kind of influence that we want to exact over the decision makers. Is it that the decision makers would love us to come up with certain things, but obviously because of their position, they may be a bit hamstrung, but then we are not living up to the expectations of some of those. Um, there was mention about the situation in Grenada with IMF and World Bank, and that can be repeated in a number of other countries. But but the, the insistence from the IMF and World Bank that the, that the trade unions must be involved came from the international trade union movement. What happens is that sometimes the unions are meeting with IMF officials and it's, it's as though the discussion then doesn't go to a level which deals with macro issues. It resides with um, the percentage increase that you didn't get. So if we are really going to deal with these things, and I always tell people this, if we don't look at ourselves and if we don't recognize who really holds that power, that power doesn't only come from walking on the street and keeping noise if we don't have the people in terms of their minds and their hearts and their understanding 
where we are coming from. And we will always have situations where there are going to be two, three, four, five, and in some places, six and seven and ten parties. We're always going to have that. We, we can't wipe that out just like that. But we have to engage in more meaningful discussions with our various publics because trade unionists are everywhere. They're in the church, mm -hmm. they're in the community groups, and therefore we have to build on that strength in order to influence the decisions that we want to see made in our various countries and globally. Uh, Sister Etna, any comments? Well, a small uh, no, yes. Listen, because uh, Brother Andrew said, Andrew said, um, indeed, a bit politics. Suriname is right a few weeks away from our election, country election. And with this uh, COVID, we nearly don't know if the elections will go through or will they be postponed. We don't know yet, but we think it will go through. But what we see is, that, just as Sandra said, we weren't involved like direct with the COVID team things and the COVID situation, but indirect the um, trade unions play the big role. And then I come back to what Sandra said about the post uh, COVID uh, world. I think there is where the role of the trade union will come in hand. Because if you look at it now, at this time, we have, uh, like uh, Brother Andrew and I already said, about the overwages weren't being paid and um, people were laid off. Some people were even, we had a few uh, people calling us, the, the ones that have no unions, they are not organized, that their boss told them to take a leave during the pandemic. So I told them you cannot take leave because the Minister of Labor himself came onto the national television and said that no leave is being given, leave off is being given to any worker. And that includes includes you too. You're not organized, but tell your boss and be, be frank with your boss because how many leave days do you have? How long will this uh, COVID uh, period go on? Do you have that many days to have go on leave? I don't think so. So I see that uh, some of the workers did that and um, they came to agreement as the rotation thing and the uh, uh, early from work and the flexible hours. And mind you, what we still seeing, because I have to say that too, is that if you look at it sometimes, some of uh, some people or some workers, everything is the, the school, everything is uh, COVID-19. In that case, I want to say, if something happened, it's because of COVID-19. They are misusing COVID-19 sometimes to bring in some kind of uh, new uh, laws or some new measures. And you have to be careful and be very um, alert that they don't use COVID or misuse COVID because they want to put in another law or another um, new uh, working hour or something like that. But you get the point where I'm heading at. Everything is COVID, COVID, COVID. Um, okay. Um, one of the the um, people viewing the, the, the program has asked if, as Sister Sandra talked about, if migration is so important, if we live in a region that is so dependent on tourism, do we require a regional approach to public health, especially the possibilities of future back pandemics? Um, but there is a regional approach to public health. <laughs> um, the, the challenge is it is not being um, funded in the way it should be. Um, there's the um, Caribbean Cooperation in Health, which is a, a, a system within the CARICOM, CARICOM Secretariat. Um, there is CARFA that we should be singing the praises of and holding up as a wonderful example of regional indicate of integration. Um, the challenge is that we are being told by the IMF and the World Bank and the CDB and all sorts of people that we think know everything 
that the way to deal with our public debt issues and the way to deal with every problem we have is to reduce the size of the public sector, to reduce spending on education, to reduce spending on health, to reduce the number of people working in the public sector. To, to I mean, to the point now where there's some countries that are talking about um, public sector workers should get a pay cut in order to pay for the COVID recovery. Like if the COVID recovery is gonna happen by waving a magic wand, it's people who have to deal with the COVID recovery. So so what, you want people to, to work harder for less? So we do have that kind of approach. We do have regional views on it. And I think it is really now up to us in the trade union movement and particularly those of you who do have the influence at the regional level to help us, those of us who are at the international level, to feed into those discussions. Um, if I could quickly state, next week, um, the World Health Assembly is, is going to be meeting virtually. Um, PSI, as a global trade union, has a working relationship with the, with the WHO. Um, and as you would have seen and heard, sorry, in, in, in the little bio, I am on one of their working groups with the WHO that looks at gender equity and, and, well, a number of other working groups as well. It is our work at local and national and regional levels that should be filtering into these discussions. You, you, would, have, you would have been following some of the, the to and fro in about the role of the WHO and who really um, controls things. It's, it's the member states. And if as the trade union movement, we are fully cognizant and aware of what that um, CCH, Caribbean Cooperation in Health phase, I think it's not phase four, says, and what our views of it would be as a trade union movement, as a Caribbean trade union movement, and we can input those into our dealings with our various ministries, not just the minister, with our various ministries of health and wellness, and as well ministries of finance and labor and so on. And through that collective approach, we are able to bring our people along and make these examples and show the evidence. Then we have a fighting chance of making things better. But if we view things like that as something out there, it's not really a trade union thing and this one is dealing with the blue economy, so that's not a trade union thing, then we're going to be lost. Everything is interrelated. And if we don't get involved in that, particularly at a regional level and using the resources within our respective and individual trade unions across the Caribbean, then we would have done a disservice to those who are coming after us. We, we, I think a lot of it has to do with how we are going to approach this, this post-COVID recovery, and particularly for those um, sisters and brothers who are on these national task forces that are supposed to be shaping it. We have to be feeding them the information, and we also have to be arming, sorry for using that word, but arming or young activists with all this so that they can start to take up those fights and actually be making the inputs into the various discussions and moving forward. We do have a lot of regional systems in place. Sadly, our trade union movement doesn't seem to be as involved as it ought to be in giving its perspectives um, on those things, and even in some cases, finding ways in which they can be approved. Mm -hmm. Sister Claudette. No comment. It was very good said. That's the same thing here because <laughs> no, when Sandra says, I, I tell you, when Sandra says something, it take note. No, she's right. I agree with her. Okay. Well, well, um, Sandra did may um, say a, a very important word: recovery um, in the context of the, the post-COVID re recovery. And one of the viewers have, has actually asked the question. Um, if we are convinced that the regional agenda is to combat inequality, to combat in inequity, or just to um, put the economy back on track. Your views? 
Yeah, I, I don't think so. I um, um, so, but let me separate this answer. This is what our objective should be, and that is what we as the labor movement have been discussing. But in relation to what I will call the establishment in terms of the political directorates, mm -hmm. I think that their approach is business as usual to get back as to how we were before or even worse off, meaning that there'll be they see this as having will accept what you call collateral damage. Mm -hmm. A number of workers will be without jobs. Um, they will be looking to give handouts because a number of political organizations in the region survive on the basis of handouts. The mentality that people must be dependent on them to eat. So I do not believe that it is in their objective. Or their con and that is why the labor movement has been deliberately left out in the response. This didn't happen by chance. And also recognizing that we found ourselves in a catch-22 position. That where traditionally there are certain issues you will fight on. But because the issue confronting us with COVID-19 was one of health, mm -hmm. we had to make a call. And I know we discussed that and we took a conscious position on it. We told the public that. We highlighted the difficulties that we had, especially in Grenada. We, we called out the administration. But we are also conscious that at the same time, we needed to enforce encourage our members and general public to follow the directives of the administration in terms of keeping healthy, in, in terms of following the advice from the Ministry of Health. So we, we had to ensure that our fight in terms of our focus at that time pass was on health. And that is why in the recovery process, one of the things that we must do and we must lead that fight for is to ensure that there are workplace protocols to deal with COVID-19, so that if and when there is a case at a workplace, what do you do? What have we done in Grenada in the absence of this? We have had to instruct workers, and we did so fearlessly and publicly, instruct our members not to go to work. Not to go to work until and on such time that the necessary tests have been done. So, so for instance, as a practical example, in one of our larger workplaces, Last week, um, last week, last week, Saturday um, or so, there were the second mass testing of workers because at that workplace, there were positive tests of COVID. The employer instructed the workers to report to work. We, the Technical and Allied Workers Union, instructed our members not to report to work. And we worked really connected with our members in terms of social media. So we are able to reach 99.9% of our workers. Only two workers slipped through the crack because of the late notice, but we were able to get them to go back at home. And at the same time, what did we do? We wrote the Ministry of Health, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Labor, the Prime Minister, and everyone drawing to their attention that we have instructed our members not to report to work and calling upon the Ministry of Health to do what is right to ensure that the necessary tests have been done, et cetera. So we want to ensure that there is a protocol in place so that if and when a case is identified, which department closes down? Or is it the whole company that should shut down? Yes, the worker should be quarantined. The worker should be quarantined. The necessary protocol goes into place. And before returning to work, that the, the necessary test should also be done. And therefore, yesterday, yes, I think it was yesterday, um, at that workplace, at that workplace, there was the sanitizing of the workplace where a company was brought in under the supervision of the Technical and Allied Workers Union, our union, the Ministry of Health, and the company to ensure that that place was properly sanitized in terms of washed down, sanitized, etc. So we have to ensure that's our responsibility in our view that we have for all of the workplaces so that even in the public sector and, and here I'm just loosely saying public sector because as far as I'm concerned, all workers are workers, right? Um, that because most governments have been shut down, that before the workers go back out to work, there should be a protocol in place in ensuring that the places have been sanitized, how you go back out at what stage, etc. So these things are extremely important in our view to be addressed. 
Thank you, comrade. Um, this has been a really interesting discussion, a very, very interesting uh, uh, discussion, bringing out the regional uh, point of view um, that matches up in many ways with the local discussion that we had with our um, resident federations. Uh, some of the, the most important points that, that stuck out to me um, involved the protection of worker rights during uh, this, this period of um, dealing with the pandemic, um, regional solidarity that came across on, on several occasions as well between the trade unions, uh, union involvement in the process of reopening the economy, making sure that workers are safe during that process, but still with a willingness um, to make compromise and to engage in partnerships to protect uh, the economy as a whole. And one of the, the more provocative um, ideas um, that was expressed was the way in which um, this is a, a public health issue um, that is connected to global austerity measures. And the need to address that if we are to come out of um, this COVID pandemic um, in a way that protects both workers and the economy. Um, I, I'm really glad to hear the discussion um, go the way of not really, not staying in the context of the COVID pandemic, but going forward into what will the world look like? What will our world look like um, post COVID? So what I'd like to do now is to invite um, all of the panelists to give a summary um, position before we um, sign off. And so for closing remarks, um, Brother Andre, I let you open in this as well, the second innings. Okay, thanks again. Um, this has been useful, but it will not make sense, and it may be close to a waste of time. Although I'm glad to be with my comrade, Etnel, and Sandra, and Eon, it will be almost a waste of time if we allow this to happen just as most discussions, we meet, we talk. Um, I look forward to some action points. Um, comrades, mm -hmm. I will expect the CPRANI to help us with that. As you, as you put together those documents, those lessons from there. And um, for us to give our commitment um, with some action points at some stage as to what we can do to build on that discussion and to identify um, three or four items that we can really take and, and run with, right? Um, because we have recognized that it is a common, most, quite a number of issues are common to the region. Uh, and therefore, we have that responsibility. So the CCL have a responsibility. PSI has that responsibility. Um, C47 have that responsibility. And if you're, we are all speaking here for workers. And this is a working class issue. And it is not just about the employed or the unionized, but also the unemployed. It's about a wider society. And Sandra, Kamar Sandra, you're absolutely right. We need to engage the public more, and the public needs to know more of what we do. And, and even if we are not able to change things overnight, we can certainly shift the dialogue. We can influence the dialogue by our involvement in the public discussions. And that will, that, that will help us. But at the end of the day, one of the first things that we can do is the, and Chris Sanja spoke about it as an evaluation. I mean, just in, in addressing the public health issue, we must address also the aspect of the, the income of a number of our workers, because it is not by chance that it is a marginalizing society, some of us that have the, our members that have the underlying condition, diabetes, high blood pressure, some of these things that are susceptible to this disease, and it happens in some of the poorer neighborhoods. So we must address those issues. I will again want to thank CPRNI, Commerce, and I look forward to our ongoing discussions and relationship. And just, just what must be replicated is the, to thank CPRNI for the training course that was held in Grenada in March. 
as a matter of fact, um, um, the, one of the most immediate and direct impact of COVID-19 was the cancellation of our social um, on, on, on the, the, the ferry. And we took it so seriously in the labor movement in Grenada that we canceled that before the state had shut down any activity. Um, so Cipriani, um, it, it, it is useful, and, and, and we are very grateful for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sister Etna, your closing remarks? Yes, thank you. Um, I want to say, this is Sandra also said, it's a public um, issue, and it's an issue for everybody, even through the whole Caribbean, the whole world. What COVID has showed us is that we need to be together, we need to unite and we need to fight the same, the same enemy, the COVID. And if you're going to do it as a trade unionist, or you're going to do it as a person or as an organization, no matter what you do, you're going to have to look to work together. And I think together we can fight the COVID. And if it comes to new protocols on the occupational safety and health, then so will be it. Maybe it will be a protocol that we will make all together, and maybe it will be some um, issues that will always have to stay in contact with each other. And I want to say thank you to Cipriani for this opportunity, because we are still following every discussion, every major issues, and as Sandra said, in the um, organizations who are busy with our health in the Caribbean, that we keep following their instructions also and their um, good work, and that we as uh, trade unionists here in Suriname are also willing to give some support and, of course, solidarity to all of our comrades within the region. Stay safe, follow the protocols, and don't take that it is COVID-free in your country, but be careful. That's what I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Sandra. Great, thank you. I, I think I want to refer to um, some points made by our General Secretary, Rosa Pavanelli, um, in recent discussions and articles about um, COVID-19 and what we're going to do in terms of making the world a better place. Um, and I, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but when we had the global financial crisis, we, we have to admit that as unions, we, we weren't able to do enough mm -hmm. to prevent workers from bearing the ultimate cost of the crisis. But this time, this time, our response has to be different. Mm -hmm. The questions are, should we go back to a normal where employers are allowed to selfishly dodge their responsibilities to employees? Should we go back to a normal where healthcare is reserved for those who can afford it? Should we go back to a normal where corporations and the mega rich can use tax havens to steal from our frontline services? Should we go back to a normal where the public sector is slashed, privatized and understaffed to the brink of collapse? We have to prevent workers from bearing the cost again. We have to make sure that this, this philanthropy that we're hearing, um, for example, this situation where Mark Zuckerberg is going to give a $25 million US dollar donation, that's, that's just like if a nurse donates $30. So <laughs> let, let, let's make a real change in what it is that we want to see in our world. Let's transform it. This is one chance that we have. Let's mm -hmm. make sure that this crisis does not go to waste. Let's make sure that there's people over profit. Thank you all very much. Thank you all, Cipriani. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, panelists, for being here and contributing um, so well to the discussion. Um, Cipriani College of Labor and Cooperative Studies and Elma Francois uh, Institute for Research and Debate actually sees our our mission um, as to facilitate that regional uh, solidarity, to facilitate the connectivity between trade unions throughout the region, and um, to, to be that voice that, that Sister Sandra was talking about that, that seeks to 
uh, bring the general public into the discussion and, and help to get that kind of support for the labor movement and for the trade unions um, who represent the, the labor movement. Um, the webinar series continues um, after this with another regional effort. Um, next week, we are going to have um, ministers of labor across the region discussing uh, the same issues and that will be moderated by our director, Dr. Andre Vincent Henry. And so on behalf of the director and on behalf of the Elmer Francois Institute of Research and Debate coordinator, Mr. Atkins Vidal, I would like to thank the, the panelists once again. I want to invite you all to come back. This is just the beginning and we will have many issues to talk about in the years forward. And I would like to thank all of the viewers who took the time out to sit with us today. We went into a little over time, but I think it was, was well worth it. So thank you all. Please um, don't be fooled by the term post-COVID. When we go back out to work, COVID will still be there. So please do everything that is necessary to be safe and to protect yourself and your families.